I'd like to take the little bit longer view, and I was asked to assess the issue of people, planet, profit. I hope that this is working. Yes, it is. So it's the triple P, everybody talks about it, and yeah, sure, sounds like a nice deal, but how much can we really do? I have the impression that uh, with the economic crisis, people get a little bit less uh, attentive to the sustainability issue. They see it more as a luxury thing. So maybe in this triple P thing, uh, something has changed and that we still have profit on the top and people and planet a slow third. So, what is a sustainable development? According to the Brundtland uh, report, it is meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. We've just heard about peak oil, we've heard about sugar. I'll be talking a little about sugar, by the way, today. So, let's see what is really going on and how things are interconnected. Let me take you to Indonesia, my country where we once had vast areas of forest. Less than 50 years ago, 90% of Borneo was still under forest, and now we have about 58 million hectares of this land, which is totally useless, where a grass grows that exudes a poison cyanide-like compound that prevents trees from growing, will burn over and over again, does not hold water, has no productivity whatsoever. How did that happen? It has a lot to do with what you are doing in the stock markets, actually. The environmental degradation is linked in many ways to what you do. For example, the nutrient crisis. We've been exporting from the developing world all this cattle feed. And now in Europe you have to pay in order to get rid of the shit, literally. Yeah? And in uh, the developed countries, where you have a lack of nutrients, you're now losing a lot of the production potential. And if those unprotected soils now start eroding and they put sediment into the lakes, then you get this water hyacinth, then you get a lot of clogging up, you have less hydropower, you got flooding, you have less transportation and fishery possibilities, so the effects are quite big. And when Fukushima happened, all of a sudden, hey, coal goes up. So we already have about a million hectares of these lands, open pit mining going on, which is going very, very fast. But once this is open, it will never grow back. We have lands like this in Pennsylvania for 80 years. Not a single um, piece of grass has grown back. The same thing I've seen for 30 years in Borneo. So you are losing the potential uh, of generating the needs of the future generation. And you know what this is? Gold. So, financial crisis, people invest in gold. Well, so what is happening? People are opening up hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of hectares of land and creating these white sand deserts which are impossible to regenerate. It takes an enormous amount of effort to bring back this land into the productive system. So we're eating into our planet and the local people are paying the price. They're working with the mercury, they're working with the cyanide to get all that gold out and to satisfy the needs of the financial markets. And when we look at water, we have those big peat swamps in Indonesia, about 50% of all the swamps in the world, but right now they're being exploited for oil palm plantations and what happens is that these up to 25 meter thick sponges that hold the water and slowly release, release it and keep the rivers clean are now directly distributing that water with a lot of erosion to the rivers, meaning no good transportation anymore, no more fish in the rivers, the mud is killing off the coral reefs, there's no more breeding grounds for fish downstream, uh, people living on the coast are losing their income. So how are all these aspects included in the business plans of making a nice plantation? So much money goes in and per year you get so much money back. We need to do more of the natural resource accounting to get a true value of what a real business is. When people need raw materials, they start doing monocultures. They grow all these eucalypts or pines, but they are very susceptible to diseases and to fires, so you create bigger and bigger risks. And the biodiversity, these peat swamps that we are now losing to the oil palms at a tremendous rate contain so many plants that we don't even know yet. And still about 50% of all the medication that you are using is in some way related to the tropical rainforest. Now we are creating, like 
these grass fields like your mon in front with no biodiversity whatsoever and all the poisons that are no longer allowed to be used here in Europe and in America, dildurin paraquat are being dumped in these developing countries, poisoning the groundwater for hundreds of years. How are you going to compensate for that? We're losing local know-how at an incredible speed. These longhouses with these Dayak people, where I was a couple of weeks ago, are still clinging on to life are now not even capable of repairing their longhouses anymore because all the forest where they took their medicine, their meat and their materials is gone. And alcoholism becomes a big problem and the whole society is collapsing and the know-how about those forests is disappearing. Food security, when we decide to make ethanol from corn, it's directly impacting uh, the food of a lot of people in this world. And we know in Mexico that the prices rose and we have had food riots already. They're going to be more and more abundant. And when we are opening these forest lands for reforestation, you may think you're doing reforestation, but actually you are creating a giant compost heap that is emitting all these greenhouse gases, which is going to lead to sea level rise, to loss of biodiversity to creating less stable systems. And this, once these forests and that peat starts burning, it goes all around the world. That's the black carbon, sometimes called brown smog. It's depositing these particles on the ice sheets. And as a result, the glaciers and the ice caps are melting faster than ever before. And this is going to cause huge problems. And we are now already seeing in the Himalaya about a 40% reduction in the glaciers. And how many decades did Bangladesh and India fight about the water of the Ganges? More than 30 years, almost war. Finally, they had a deal, and now the water is gone. They only have flooding or they have shortages. So what is happening with the raised temperature in the Gulf of Bengal? About 150 million people will suffer more extreme weather events, and they are going to flee. They won't have a future there. So what's India doing? Building a 6,450 kilometer long wall to keep those people out. Well, those people are also going to come to the developed countries. So the things at stake here are truly horrific. So if we look at deforestation in Borneo, it has been going on so fast. And the orangutans that I work with are suffering greatly. But it's not just the orangutans, it's also the local people, it's also the long-term economy and the potential to produce products. Those are not nice images, so people keep talking. Every meeting, we keep postponing. People seem to be focused on these very short political re-election cycles only. There are no longer any real statesmen around that have this long-term vision. Where are we going with the United Nations? And yeah, you're all talking about the next year and the next year, but I'm thinking about where my grandchildren are going to be living and how they are going to pay the price for the decisions that are being taken today. So I'd like to show you something about Sambodja Lestari. This was one of those totally ruined areas. And I was challenged by my accountant saying, OK, wonderful, all this tree planting of yours, but you're really good if you can make a forest that's worth something in this place. So I took on that challenge and decided, yeah, let's try to create life in harmony. And I did it here in East Kalimantan on just a small area, 4,500 acres of totally denuded land. There was really like nothing left there. And yeah, you couldn't find actually a worse place. So the people were more than 50% jobless, they had huge health risks, they have the poorest district, they paid 22% of their income for water, there was no productivity of the soil left whatsoever, they had a very low life expectancy, filled crops, it was a disaster area because it had been totally overexploited. First logging, then illegal logging, then slash and burn agriculture, and finally fires. Nevertheless, in four years later, there were twice as many jobs and the people had much better health. There were much fewer social problems amongst the people. No more flooding, no more fires. And there was a value created of several million dollars a year in terms of drinking water while recreating a biodiverse system by integrating things. 
So this was where we put our little first hut in the middle of the area. And this is then four years later. And it turned into a green spot on the map of the earth that you may think, okay, that's a nice little piece. But it was a special place because we planted many different trees and tried to do it in such a way that it created value, not just in terms of that little number on some account, on some piece of paper on, or on a screen, but really the long-term value. So we wanted to go from total destruction to creating a fully functional forest again, while putting the local people's interest in the first place. And at the same time, same time still trying to uh, do what we could for the biodiversity and show that it actually would bring you money. And I'm going to show you some numbers a little bit later also. So how do you do that? You start off with the begin situation, you have a plan. That's basically what all of you do. And then you make like a kind of recipe. What are your inputs? What are the factors that you can control in terms of fertilizer, plant choice, money that you put in? And then you look what are the outputs that you can then value, but not just value only the wood. No, you look at the security, you look at how people's home are. You look at what is the biological value. So that total package is much more in, uh, even uh, together as the sum of those individual parts. And those individual parts should be taken into account. So how do you do that in practice? So we started doing, growing very low value trees on a piece of grassland. So we could shade out the grass there and we could get a little bit of the soil fertility back and get the microclimate ready for other trees. So they could yield some timber after about eight years, but not very valuable, so you have to preserve it. We can do that when we use the smoke from bamboo peels, but if you plant bamboo, it's very fire susceptible, so you're going to create risk. So you have to do it a little bit later, only along the waterways, and then you can, at the right moment that these uh, acacia trees are going to have the timber, then you also have the material ready to make it worthwhile. So you have to integrate it. There's not just a single solution to it. Another one. How do you plant these trees? If you grow the crops between the trees, you have less competition. And you can also uh, utilize the crop fertilizer to help the trees grow faster. So the farmers get free land because in the reforestation they can do it. The system yields early income, my orangutans get some healthy food out of it all, and we can reduce the growing expenditures while speeding up the regeneration. So it's really on integration. It's not about silver bullets, one thing, one solution. And it's much more complicated. If you look at the value of the nature, then we have a huge issue once you start destroying that system, once it starts collapsing with fires. This was what happened during the El Nino of 97-98. The fire started in January, and then in February, March, April, and May. So we lost 5.5 million hectares. CARE did an analysis of how the children were growing. There was no gain in weight for one year amongst the young children, younger than 12 years. They lost on average 9 IQ points. How much is that value that you have lost by taking these very big risks in opening up these systems, departing from sustainability? They're unacceptable for me. This was like three months. The automatic lights never went off because of the smoke of those forest fires. So you have to deal with the forest fires first. Because if you can't do that, and that you can only do when you work together with the local people, then you can never make a start. So initially, this is how to do it, but you're also going to need a long-term solution that is going to prevent those fires. So you have to create stable systems, and it will do that. I did it in East Kalimantan by creating a buffer zone, especially with sugar palms and trees that would be useful for local people, and that in that way protected the bigger plan for the middle that had to create the value. So on a map it looks like that, and you integrate everything. You take garbage, because you can then produce compost, you have the energy, you can use that to do water clarification, the sediment of the water you can use to fill up your sanitary landfill in a safe way, etc. You, you create integrated systems that mimic nature.